materials have transformed the way we live, extending our day and saving us time. They've changed the spaces we choose to live in, allowing us to construct homes in bigger, higher and brighter buildings. Adapted old stuff and brand new stuff gives designers and makers a huge array of materials from which to produce the modern world. But there's one material that defines our age like no other. It's versatile, strong and scalable. It can be any colour, shape or texture and can be produced to display a dazzling variety of properties. It's the rubber in foam rubber and the glue in plywood. It's an everyday miracle in its own right and has spawned countless more everyday miracles. It has many different formulations, but we know it simply as plastic. Since the 1930s, plastic has become utterly ubiquitous. This factory alone uses over 25,000 tonnes of the stuff every year and produces over 10 million toy parts every day. The only way these toys can be made in such enormous quantities is by using injection moulding machines like these. This is a mould from a machine. You can see it comes in two halves and they fit together and create a cavity on the inside. And in this case, it looks like that produces a castle. I can show you how it works over here because it's a smaller one. You can really get into the detail. So it's quite an intricate mechanism. It's a bit like a lock. Here inside is one half of the mould. And as it's closed together, you can see that bits of the mould fall into place. And as this comes across here and in, there's a cavity created here. And then you get cooling water in here, hot plastic in here, and then at the end of that process, out it comes, the piece is made, so it's there, and then some pins jut forward and they push out the part. And there you have a fine bit of injection molding and this thing, you may be wondering what it is, <laughs> is a ghost. Not a ghost in the machine, but a ghost out of the machine. Because you can melt and re-solidify plastics like these, they're massively scalable. Any size, any shape, it's not a problem. Look, baby seals. Tiny little baby seals. This is, um, I think it's a baby T-Rex's arm. <laughs> and this is a monkey tail. So you can make anything, any size, any shape, any color. You want it, they can make it. Plastic is the ultimate manufacturing material. You can make it into any shape you like. A toy, a pen, a computer keyboard, a car bumper, or a boat. Tough and durable, or soft and bendy, from airliners to cling film. It's a designer's dream. I mean, look at this thing. It's so intricate. It's got hair, several different materials, all made in the same machine at once with moving parts. It's sort of an incredible miracle of modern engineering. And here it is being produced at the rate of 3.2 per second. I mean, that's a lot better than the human race is doing. We're doing 2.6 children per second. In the last 100 years, plastics have come to dominate the material world. It seems there really is a plastic for everything. They're so common, in fact, it's easy to forget that we're often even clothed in plastics. In the 1940s, a group of plastic fibres was introduced that would change the world of fashion forever. I'm going to attempt to make some plastic fibre. 
uh, these two chemicals. Now, one is a super called chloride solution, and the other one is a diaminohexane solution. But in a minute, you'll see that they react together. And I'm pouring it very carefully because actually one is oil-based and is floating on the top, and the other one is water-based and is sunk to the bottom. The key thing about these particular chemicals is that the small molecules of each liquid are capable of bonding together with the molecules of the other to form larger molecules, long chains, called polymers. And that's exactly what happens where they meet. A chemical reaction takes place, creating a delicate film, the polymer, between the two liquids. If I then remove the film with a pair of tweezers, a fresh boundary is created and the reaction continues. And I get huge long chains of plastic. And as long as I keep pulling, so this will continue. And if I attach this to this mandrel and rotate, <laughs> I get filament. I get as much as I want. I just keep rotating this. And as long as there are two liquids in this beaker, I get more and more of this plastic filament. And this was one of the most influential plastics in the 20th century. And it's called, of course, nylon. <laughs> nylon was developed by Wallace Carruthers at DuPont in the late 1930s. It was one of the first fully synthetic fibres. And one of the first uses for this new plastic fabric was a product, which quickly became known as nylons. In the early decades of the 20th century, the hemlines of fashionable ladies' dresses began to rise. Slowly, more and more leg was being revealed. What was needed was a cheap, sleek and sheer garment to cover the exposed skin. Nylon was quickly pressed into service. Here I've got a little box of some of the original nylon tights. These are from 1948. But there we are, look at that. This is an antique, but a beautiful one. And look, you can see the, the shaped leg, the seam down the back. These were the must-have item of the time. People rioted in the streets if the stocks ran low of this product. Woven into stockings, Nylon turned a luxury item into something actually much better than their expensive silk predecessors. Nylons were durable, easy to wash and had an attractive appearance. They were so good in fact that during World War II, when stock was scarce, women were reportedly prepared to fight just to get their hands on them. But things have actually changed a lot since then. They're not made of pure nylon anymore. In fact, if you take a pair of modern tights and have a look at them, what you get is actually something that's far more sophisticated. It has a lot of give in it for a start, and that's because there's a new material in there, not just nylon, but elastane. Here's some nylon, and this is a great, nice, stiff, strong fibre, good durability, but it doesn't have much give, and actually it'll just snap if you pull it too hard. And over here is some, a roll of elastane. Where you, you might know it as lycra, and this is very stretchy stuff. Look at that. Wow, wow, wow. And so you can stretch it quite a long way before it breaks. So the thing is, you've got these two things. One gives you a very nice feel and extra skin, and it's very sheer. And the other one gives you this flexibility. It will conform to any shape you are, any shape you want it to be. And how do you combine them together? Well, you can either weave them together, or you can actually combine them in a single fibre. Look at this. So this has got an elastane core nylon wrapped around it. This factory in Derbyshire produces more than 700,000 pairs of tights every week. Each is woven and stitched together by an array of balletic robotic machines. And because of elastane, each of the 120 different designs will be a perfect fit. Something appreciated by the women who work here. So what would life be like without tights? Very boring. You can dress an outfit up. Yeah. So yeah, the essential. Yeah. Something that's to keep warm. It's nice little bit to set your outfit up. You know? yeah. 
So life will be less sexy, less interesting, and, le and a bit cold. Yeah. yeah, I've got time to shave. They're a good cover-up. <laughs> <laughs> Synthetic fibres like nylon and elastane epitomise our mastery of materials. Our ability to invent and engineer new materials specific to our needs. And use them to manufacture products that are affordable to the greatest number of people. Our home.